Okay, we're starting tonight in Luke chapter 3. I hope everybody's got your Bible, and uh, we're going to kick right back in there. We finished up in, last, in the last study in Luke, uh, Luke chapter 2, where Jesus, uh, at the age of 12, was amazing all those that, um, I mean, totally amazing those that were at the temple, and uh, talked briefly about how uh, Joseph and Mary had left, left him there accidentally. And then we last keyed in on the idea that he was subject to his parents, chapter 2 at verse 51. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature in favor with God and man. And I emphasize the idea that this is the way we all need to continue to grow in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God and man. And so that's something that, that makes a well-rounded individual. Now Luke, like he often does, uh, picks up giving us some dates, giving us some some chronological markers when Jesus actually began his ministry. So this is the 15th year, chapter 3 at verse 1, 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. And this figures out to be roughly 29 AD, okay? Roughly 29 AD, all righty? So now we kind of have an idea, you know, according to our way of looking at it, it's year 29, all right? Pontius Pilate was the governor of Judea. Now, <clears throat> You go back and you remember some of the things we studied before in Luke. He emphasized and said in those days that in chapter 2, verse 1, and then <clears throat> earlier he also had brought out about uh, the time of Herod, chapter 1 at verse 5. So we got all of these guys coming in here, and we kind of get something else going on here at the same time. Herod's, uh, and I think I pointed out some of this to you something once before, Herod had a group of sons. One of his uh, sons was uh, Philip. Another one was um, uh, <clears throat> um, Antipater. Um, so he had about four different sons, but one of the sons actually uh, was not serving or could not serve in the area of Judea anymore because the Romans felt like they needed a Roman governor there in the city of Jerusalem, which was the capital, as it was, of the Jewish nation. So here we have a fellow by the name of Pontius Pilate. And uh, <clears throat> Pontius Pilate, we're going to see, obviously, we're not going to hear too much about him until we get back to the crucifixion, but he was a man that <clears throat> was a politician, but also was a man that was supposed to be the, the ruler of the Romans in that particular time as well. So you got four different divisions of the nation of Israel divided up, and two of them were, you might say, in essence, really run by the Roman government. You actually have the governor being in the city of Jerusalem in Judea. Now, you've, you've got that, and then you've got what we call the religious aspects. And you have Annas and Caiaphas were the high priests. Now, under the Old Testament law, <clears throat> and we read about this when Aaron died, uh, his uh, oldest son was taken up on the mount where he died, and they changed uh, his vestments. His oldest son then started wearing the high priestly garment. So it seems like, as you're reading through Scripture, that the idea was is that the high priests were supposed to live until they died, and then their son, their oldest son, would take over as high priest. <clears throat> well, we've also got to remember the political situation that's going on at this time. Rome was in charge of the whole area there. And there had been a lot of problems in Judea because there was a lot of Jews that really chafed under Roman rule. They did not and would not, um, they did not like the Roman rule. So what happened is that's the really part of the reason why they put Pontius Pilate there. And then you've also got to realize that one of the ways that they knew that they could control people was the governors would sit down and decide who was the high priest. So it's not anymore the way that it was under Jewish rule, under the Jewish system, as much as it was a political situation that where they were chosen by the rulers at that time. So you actually have Annas, who was the older man, who was the legitimate high priest, and he actually reigned from, um, according to some of the records that I see here, uh, depending on who you uh who you're reading there, but the thing that he was reigning about the time of, um, okay, hold on a second. Let me make triple sure of this. He reigned from 6 to 25 AD, something along that line. 
Now we know that also he had five different sons who succeeded him as high priest. And the other priest that was ruling at that time was a fellow by the name of Caiaphas. Caiaphas was Annas' son-in-law. So he had five of his sons succeed him as high priest. And then he was also the father-in-law of Caiaphas. And so whenever we really get into the crucifixion of Jesus, we will remember that they took him to Annas first. We will remember that they're taking him from one place to the other to have and conduct these trials in that respect. So this is all that's going on. Luke is trying to give us the definite time in a time frame we can understand. He's trying to give us the definite time frame when these things took place. And as I said, the 15th year of Tiberius would put it exactly at about 29 AD. So realizing this, this is when John the Baptist began then to start preaching. And notice, <clears throat> he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, I want you to notice very closely here, this is the same kind of uh, baptism that we find commanded in Acts chapter 2 at verse 38. Also think about the idea of what's about to happen. They had been under, the Jews had been under the law of Moses all up to this point in time. And being under the law of Moses up to that point in time, they figured that that was going to be uh, the way it was. But we also know that when Jesus came and died upon the cross, there had been prophesied that he was going to set up a new covenant. The book of Hebrews brings out this very vividly. And again, that's another great book to study that we'll do at another time. So there's going to be some changes here. Obviously, as they're going through this time phrase where there is the, the Old Testament is going to be done away with on the cross, John the Baptist is preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Jesus' disciples are going to go and preach a baptism for the remission of sins, Acts 2, verse 38. So I think there's a lot of transition times here. There's a lot of things going on differently in here at this point in time. I think it's very interesting as well that John the Baptist is preaching this baptism of repentance for the remission of sins to prepare everybody for what's about to happen with the coming of the church, with the coming of Jesus Christ. To me, this answers a lot of questions that a lot of people have when it comes to baptism. Number one, a lot of people ask, well, did the apostles, were the apostles baptized into Christ after uh, Jesus died and whenever they commanded them to do so? We have no record of that anywhere in scripture. We do read that they were preaching the gospel, but we don't read of them actually being baptized into Christ per se. But it does seem like, because we look in the book of John, that Peter and John and um, James and Andrew were disciples of John the Baptist before they were disciples of Jesus. So they would have probably been baptized with this baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Um, another person, as um, we were discussing this in, in another class in, uh, not too long ago, in the George School of Preaching brought out the fact, well, what about the thief on the cross? You know, that's always brought up to us, well, you guys teach the idea of baptism or repentance for the mission of sins. What about the thief on the cross? And he's always thrown up to us. Number one, the first thing I want to bring out to you, we don't know that he wasn't baptized. He may have very well have been baptized by, in John's baptism. But we're making an assumption that we can't prove, okay? So that's to me, is a very weak argument to make to begin with. Secondly, we do know that Jesus had power on earth to forgive sins. And we will see this as we continue to go through the book of Luke. So if Jesus had the power on earth to forgive sins, I have no problem with him forgiving that thief on the cross who obviously showed that. So, you know, I, is the thief on the cross saved? When Jesus said, today you shall be with me in paradise, I believe he was saved. I believe that with him beyond any shadow of a doubt. But those two things do bring out the idea that I'm, I'm hoping to bring out is that we don't need to always look at um, those exceptions as opposed to all the norms, and I appreciate what Dwayne is bringing out there. There's too many accounts, other accounts of the New Testament of baptism for the remission of sins, and that's what we need to be preaching and teaching and emphasizing to people, and that's what we need to continually emphasize to people, because so many churches today don't. 
So when we're looking at all of that, let's look and see how it all fits together, especially as we, we try to go through this in a little bit more detail, maybe more than what we often do. Um, obviously, when John was baptizing them, it was for the remission of sins. And it obviously was contingent upon their repentance. And this is part of the things that, that was leading up to the very same command in Acts chapter 2 at verse 38. Luke then goes on in verse 4. He says, as it is written in the book of Isaiah the prophets. And here he's quoting from Isaiah the 40th chapter, verses 3 through 5. What's also interesting to me is the idea that you see in the last uh, chapter of Malachi, uh, Malachi 3 and 4, that he talks about John's work. And now we see him quoting from Isaiah about what John's work is going to be, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be brought low. The crooked places <clears throat> would be made straight and the rough waves smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of the Lord. John's work was a preparatory work. And it, as you look at what he's trying to say here, he's, his job was to prepare the way of the Lord. And again, we also know that from Malachi. So how does he just talk about it? He talks about it in a sense of making the road so smooth that he takes care of all the dips. He brings down all the hills and makes it level and smooth to where everybody can go on it. And that's kind of a figurative language to suggest the fact that what John was doing was preparing people to follow Messiah and making it easier for them, but at the same time, making the demands that God would make. We remember in Matthew's account, whenever it starts talking about John the Baptist, and in fact, later on here in Luke, he, he's going to call people snakes and vipers. Uh, that's not the way to win friends and influence people, okay? <laughs> you know, but, but he lays it out there because folks have to hear the bad news before they will ever want or ever see the need for the good news. And so that's what John is doing. He's telling it like it is. He's letting folks know that they're not in the relationship with God they need to be in. They need to repent. And obviously, by his eccentric way of living, this is causing a lot of people to come out to him and listen to what he has to say. And obviously, his message is touching their hearts. And again, what shall, why is he doing this? to bring about to where everybody shall see the salvation of God. And obviously from Isaiah, obviously here, this is what John's work was, so that they might be prepared for when Jesus came. And they might be prepared to live the kind of lives that God and Jesus wanted and expected of them to live. Obviously, as we're continuing to look through this, we have to realize that God expects us to change. That's what repentance is all about. And we can't live and continue to live a life of sin and be acceptable to God. We have to be willing to make the changes. God doesn't have to make the changes. We do. And sometimes that's where we struggle the most because true or false, change is hard for all of us. Especially as we get older, it's hard for us because we're getting get settled in the way we're doing things. And the thing is, is that, and Dwayne and I were talking about this last week and last Sunday morning about the idea of the that he expects us to, to change, to grow. The only way we're ever going to really grow in Christ is to be willing to change our lives, change our attitudes, and, and become what he wants and expects of us to be. So verse 7 emphasizes the idea that he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, brood of vipers, offspring of snakes, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? As I said, people have got to hear the bad news before they hear the good news. We need to understand what sin is. We need to understand what it does to our relationship with God. We need to understand what it does to our relationships to one another. We need to understand the importance and what it cost God and his son to bring about our salvation. I am fearful in America today because it seems like we we disregard sin. We don't, we, we, you know, we kind of sit back and say, well, it's no big deal. But God says it was. It's a big deal because Jesus 
had to die for it. So I need to look all the time at my life, see where I am with him and, and truly ask myself, have I truly repented? Am I truly doing what God wants and what God expects of me to do? And so those things are very important. That's what he's trying to get them to do. Notice the ideal of warning you to flee from the wrath to come. Another motive for obedience a lot of times is the reality of judgment. Now, again, a lot of times we don't talk a lot about that because we want to emphasize to people they need to follow God out of love and respect for him. And that's true. But a lot of times, let's also be honest about this. We have young children at home. They don't really understand the idea of concept of love. Uh, they might give you big kisses and things along that line because their emotions are telling them to do that. But whenever mom and dad tells them not to do something, they go ahead and do it anyway. You know, they have to be disciplined. Punishment has to take place for them to learn that what? I cannot continue in this activity. We have done away with hellfire preaching in the church because that's not politically correct. But even if we don't preach about hellfire, it's still there. And we need to bring it out. And John was bringing it out. Who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So there is something to be said about that motive of punishment to help us to be pushed toward the relationship with God to where after and as long as we develop a relationship with God, we then start doing it out of love, not out of fear. I think a lot about this because, again, you think about bringing up our children. Think about how whenever a person becomes a Christian, they're a baby in Christ. They have to be taught the same way, and they need to understand the fear of the punishment to hopefully drive them to the arms of the loving Father that's willing to help them to grow in love to where they're doing it now, not because they're afraid of punishment, but because they just simply love the Father. You see, that's, that's part of growing as a Christian. He notice he says, therefore, and I've always sold this, said this, and I'll keep on saying it, always look what the therefore is there for, okay? Therefore is a connecting verse. So he's done this. He says, he's preached this baptism of repentance. He's preached them about their sin. And then he says, listen, bear fruits worthy of repentance. What does that suggest? There needs to be changes in your life, John is saying, to where people can see that you are bearing a different kind of fruit. You're not bearing the fruit of sin. You're bearing the fruit of what God wants you to bear. We think about Galatians 5 here. We talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Again, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, goodness. Um, all those things are coming into play there. So he says, it has to, our, our repentance has to show in the fruit that we bear in the life that we lead. And so he's saying to them, listen, you want to be in the right relationship with God. You need to be baptized. Again, this baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. You need to understand that you need to bear fruits worthy of that repentance. After you've been baptized, you can't go back living the kind of life you were. You now have made a commitment to God. And furthermore, he says, don't sit back and talk about your parentage. You know, I, there's even people in the church to do that. The Jews were doing this a lot. They would make the statement, well, we're the descendants of Abraham. And God made promises to Abraham that God's going to keep. And, and that's true. But the ultimate fulfillment that he was making there was about Jesus coming and providing them the way of salvation. I've heard people say, well, I've been born, I, you know, I was born and raised in the church of Christ. You know, like, like that's something to brag about. If you're not living the life that God wants you to live, that doesn't mean a thing. So I think it's very important as we're looking at the context of this. He said, the Jews were saying, we have Abraham as our father. <laughs> He said, listen, that's nothing. God can make these stones into the descendants of Abraham. And truly, that's the fact. God could make stones or make st people out of stones. And so he begins now to really emphasize the idea of the end of the Jewish system. The axe, he says, is laid to the root of the trees. 
when you take an ax and you cut down a tree, depending on how big the tree is, the tree might grow back up if you still lift part of the shoot up. There will be shoots that come up from the stump. Um, I saw this a lot from various trees I've cut down over the years and I cut down or I cut the limb off and there'll be another limb sprouting right around that same area, okay? He said, now the ax instead is just cutting down the tree, it's cutting at the roots. God was going to do away with the whole Jewish system with the whole Jewish system of trying to keep the Ten Commandments and keep those 522 or excuse me, 612 laws that we read about from Leviticus all the way through Deuteronomy. He says, the reason why the Hebrew writer says that God gave those laws is to show us what sin was. Many of the Jews were trying to keep them perfectly. And the problem with that was that nobody could do that. Nobody could keep that law perfectly. The only person that ever did was Jesus. And he had to keep it perfectly so as to fulfill the law, so as to do away with that law and then set up a new covenant. So all these things are coming into play here. And so when he says the ax is laid to the root of the trees, in the context of what John and who John is preaching to, he's talking to the Jewish people. And he's saying, this system is going to be done away with. You're now going to have to understand that God has sent Messiah and the whole system has been turned upside down. Every tree, he said, that does not bear good fruit shall cut down and is thrown into the fire. Jesus in John 15 compares us to being in the vine. And he says, if we don't bear fruit, what's he going to do? He's going to cut off the, the dead branches and put them into the fire. So the similarities between what John is saying here, what Jesus says at the end of his ministry in John 15, and obviously from what we read also in John as Jesus began preaching, are very, very, very much the same. John's preaching, Jesus' preaching is very, very much the same. The terms of salvation under John's preaching, baptism and repentance for the remission of sins, Jesus' preaching, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. John's preaching, you've got to stop sin. Jesus preaching, you know, we can make so many of the comparisons. Why then, somebody asked, did, did Jesus have to die? John was doing this preaching. Well, Jesus had to die to take care of the sins. And so the, all of this comes together. So he says, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. You don't want to be thrown into the fire. You don't want that judgment, the judgment the wrath to come, that all is tied together here. So he says, they say, well, what shall we do? The people say, well, you know, what are you saying? Now, notice, this is the way people are always acting. Once they find out the bad news, that they're sinners and that they need God's grace, then they're always asking, what, what can we do? Even today, you know, people will ask, what must I do to be saved? We see that as we go through the book of Acts. What must I do? What must I do? How can I get right with God? And notice, as John begins to preach here, he's emphasizing the idea from the Old Testament laws. He says, he who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. He who has food, let him do likewise. In other words, you need to be helping the poor. You need to be helping those that are in need. You need to be willing to help, get, you know, if we've got two or three uh, coats, give to someone who has none. Have food, share it. Under the Old Testament system, this was commanded under the Old Testament. And you're sitting there scratching your head again because like, well, John, if you're if this whole thing is changing now, why does he go back to the Old Testament to emphasize it? Well, obviously the Jews weren't doing it. They were finding a ways around it. And do we do the same? Do we try to find some ways around some of the things that God has commanded us to do? Well, do I have to, you know, we start asking those, well, do I have to do, you plug in the blank. Do I have to do, no, you don't have to do it. God's not going to twist your arm behind your back and make you do it, but, but what? You're going to have to answer to God for not doing it. And the Jews had, had done that. I mean, they had supposedly lived this, quote, righteous law, but a lot of them weren't always living up to it. Surprise, surprise, surprise. See, that's the thing about religions a lot of times. We, we know what we need to be doing, but we don't always do it, do we? 
He says, the tax collectors came to be baptized. Now, this is interesting. These tax collectors that were always hated by the Jews because they were sellouts to the Romans, they came to be baptized. And one of the things that I want to really point out to you, as John is preaching, as Jesus preaches, he preaches to the people that a lot of times the rest of the Jewish nation would have nothing to do with. I believe part of the reason why Luke is emphasizing the work of women is because a lot of the Jews look down their nose at women. In fact, some of the Jewish prayers would actually say, and I'm not making this up, there are references to this, that they would thank God that they were not born a Gentile, and the men would thank God that they were not born as a woman. They would say this in their prayers. Luke is saying the gospel is for everybody, for tax collectors, for the fringe of society, for the poor, for the needy. The gospel is for these folks because they're the ones that know how much they need God. So what a great lesson for all of us. What does he say to the tax collectors? <clears throat> Teacher, what shall we do? Collect no more than what is appointed for you. Because the Jews hated the tax collectors, and by the way, we still don't really fall in love with tax collectors today, do we? How many of you love the bills every time you have to pay them? You know, uh, those ad valorem taxes on the cars and, and the gas tax and the sales tax. We Most of us don't even think about those, but whenever you have to pay tax on your house, oh, oh, look at how much my taxes have been raised lately. You know, who, what is it paying for? Well, it's paying for all the stuff government's spending money on, you know? And that's what it boils down to. And, and so think about it. Nobody likes tax collectors. So if you were a Jew and you had sold yourself or made an agreement with the Romans to collect the taxes, you were automatically considered to be an enemy. They would have, you would be kicked out of the synagogue. And furthermore, if you would be looked down on, especially by the religious elite. Many times we find Jesus eating with common people, tax collectors and others. And the Pharisees would see that I sit there in the corner and say, well, how, why does your master eat with the tax collectors and sinners? Because that's who he's came to save. And so these things come into play here. And so they said, well, the click no more than for what is appointed for you. So if you were a tax collector at that time and somebody has given you a hard time about paying the taxes, you had the right to charge whatever you wanted to as a fee for collecting the taxes. So you give that tax collector a hard time and guess what? Oh, I'm sorry, I made a miscalculation here. How much did I say you owed? Oh, well, we're gonna have to double that. <laughs> and, and they couldn't do nothing about it. They couldn't do nothing about it. Many of the tax collectors were rich. Luke is gonna tell us about the one tax collector that we know by name and who was that? The wee little man, remember him? Zacchaeus, right? He's going to be the one that tells us about Zacchaeus. That's interesting. The soldiers come up and ask him, what shall we do? And he says, do not intimidate anybody or accuse falsely. In my margin of my Bible in the New King James Version, it says, do not intimidate. The word intimidate could also mean shake down for money. You know, <laughs> so you think about it. You, you've got a soldier there with a sword. And he could tell you what you can and can't do and says, oh, by the way, you don't like me being here? That's fine. Just give me what you got and I'm going to follow you home and you're going to give me some more because you know what? You don't like me. I'm, I'm going to give you a reason not to like me. And we're sitting there thinking to ourselves, well, man, that's, that's cruel. That's just, but that's the way they were. That's the way they operated. That's the way you operate in systems like this. And so here you have this situation. Do not intimidate anybody or accuse anyone falsely and being con content with your wages. So the people were in expectation and all reason in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ, the Messiah or not. And John answered. So as they hear him preaching, as they're being baptized, as they're being obedient to what he says and what God is telling them to do, they're now asking, is this the Christ? You see, this is what they've been looking forward to. 
the Bible closed with Malachi talking about the one that's going to prepare the way, the Elijah. Isaiah had prophesied about it. Isaiah was the Messianic prophet. Talk more about the Messiah under the Old Testament than seemingly any others. So when you start thinking about all of this, they're thinking, well, this could be the Messiah. This could be it. And John said, no, I baptize you with water. But one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. We could spend an hour and a half on that one verse. Number one, notice how John felt about his relationship with Jesus. Jesus says, I wouldn't even be worthy to unbuckle his sandal. Now, if you were living at that time, you would have your Lord and master. And if you were a slave, your job would be to take the sandals off, wash your master's feet, do whatever the master wanted you to do. And that would literally be the lowliest job for the lowliest servant of the master. And he says, I'm not even worthy to take his sandals off. That's how John felt about Jesus. Think about the idea that no doubt Zacharias and Elizabeth had told him about Mary. Could it be that somewhere along the line before they began their ministries, they connected with one another? Maybe got to know one another. Well, that, we don't know. As the Bible opens up, the New Testament opens up, He, John is preaching. Jesus is, is old enough to be there. The only events that we really read about their births are what we read here in the book of Luke. So could it be that they have maybe have spent time together before then? Maybe so. We don't know. But I'm not going to rule it out. Think about the idea as well. He said, I'm not worthy to do that. He says, he will baptize you. And what does the word baptize mean, by the way? What does baptize mean? Immerse, dip, okay? All those phrases come in there. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, before Jesus died upon the cross, he spent John 13, 14, 15, and 16 promising his disciples that he was going to baptize them with the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26 talks about the idea that he was going to bring all things to their remembrance. John 16, 13 said that he was going to, <clears throat> the Spirit was going to guide the apostles into all truth. So we also know that the apostles would lay hands on certain people after that. Read Acts chapter 8, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14. And the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit would be given to that next generation of Christians to be able to help them to know truth from falsehood. There would be the gift of prophecy, the gift of healing, the gift of miracles, the gift of speaking in tongues, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as you read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So Jesus came to baptize them with the Holy Spirit. And truly this is what it's found its fruition in as we see the beginning of the church and so forth, as well as fire. Now, how did Jesus come with fire? Well, with the words of Jesus and the words of his apostles and the words of those preachers in the next generations as they went on down the line, they're going to be continuing to talk about the possibility of judgment unless people repented. Again, as I said earlier, we don't preach that much about judgment anymore. Judge not that you be not judged, right? <laughs> so we don't preach that. We're not hearing about it as much as we once did. So maybe perhaps we bought into the lie that Satan's telling us now, God is just so good and merciful. He's just going to forgive us all of all of our sins and all of us are going to be saved. Sounds kind of nice, doesn't it? But is it the truth? Does that fit within everything else the Bible is saying? We go on. His winnowing fan is in his hand. We don't really grasp this in our culture, especially in our farmers, but what they would do at that time is they would go out and literally cut down the wheat. They would cart down the barley with these scythes, bring it all in, and then they would put it in a what they called a threshing floor. Animals or people would walk on it. The kernels of grain would fall to the ground, and then they would take a, 
a winnowing shovel and they would throw it up when the wind was blowing and the chaff would blow off and they would leave, that would leave the wheat kernel, the barley or whatever it is they were doing, they would leave that there to be gathered and then to be cleaned and washed and to be cooked. Here he's talking about the idea of the winnowing fan is at hand suggesting the idea that he's going to get rid of the chaff. Now, notice earlier he said the, the Holy Spirit and fire. How's it going to happen? Again, think about the chaff a lot of times would be burned. The chaff would be blown away. It was worthless. So he's talking here about people. And he's talking about the people who have not changed, have not repented, have not come to God and been what they needed to be, and as a result of that, even though they might think everything is right, even though they might think that thought everything is right with God, it isn't until the time of judgment that they find out that they're lost. And we've always got to remember that God is not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. But part of the message of the gospel, good news, is that God, being just, has to punish the wicked. Not because he wants to, but because he loves them enough to allow them to make the choices that they wish to make. And that's, that's really coming home and I think should hit home to all of us. Our choices that we make to love and serve God or to love and serve ourselves are going to be very apparent on the day of judgment. He said he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor. He's going to clean it out very well. I mean, it's not going to be a, a partial judgment. It's going to be an utter, complete judgment. He gathers the wheat into the barn, but the what? The chaff he will burn with what? Unquenchable fire. How can a loving God, how can a loving God, people ask, how can a loving God do that to people? It's because of his love. What do you mean? God chooses to love us. And as I've been teaching on Sunday morning, or Sunday night this month, the month of Valentine's, by the way, We've been talking a lot about the idea of love, and I've brought out the idea that love is a choice. We have to choose to love God. And if I choose to love God, that necessarily means that what? I'm going to do what's going to make him happy. I love my wife, Larissa. I believe she is the best thing, and I thank God for her every day. So I do certain things for her because I love her. It's choices that I make to do that. And, and the thing is, is that's the way God, and, and this is, the, the relationship of a husband and a wife is, is somewhat close to what we're talking about, the relationship of God and, and his servants, Christians. As Christians, we do what we do because we love God. Sometimes we're not perfect at that because we're human beings. Sometimes we're not good husbands. Sometimes we're not good wives. Sometimes we're not good in that respect, because of all our failings and shortcomings, God's love is perfect. And because he loves, he gives us the right to choose whether or not we're going to love him. He gives us the right to choose whether or not we're going to serve him. And We, a lot of times, because we don't really understand this love as we should, and again, I've been doing a little bit more study on it. It's making me think a lot more about it, too. But why do we do what we do? Because we love them, because of that emotion, or because we choice? There are times whenever we might be mad at somebody, but we could still choose to love that person and do good for them, even though they are against us and have done something to hurt our feelings slash hurt us in some way or another. We have the right to make that choice. That's exactly the choice God's made for all of mankind because we are the epitome of his creation and he's giving us the right to choose. We're not like animals in the fact that we have and we just do certain things because it's innate in us. 
God gives us the right to choose. But he will love us enough to honor our choices. So if I choose not to love him, he will love us enough to honor that choice by allowing us to deal with the consequences of that choice. Is that harsh? Is that, does that help us to understand a little bit more God's love? Does that make you scratch your head a few minutes? Well, the reality is he's not going to force us to be Christians. He's not going to force us to do the things he's commanded us to do. True or false? Maybe many of us would like that. Maybe we would like to be forced to do it because then we'd have to do it. But is that love? Not really, right? I do it because I have to, not because I want to. So whenever I think about this whole idea of him burning the chaff, he is honoring the decisions of those who have chosen not to follow him. That's love. Seems like a contradiction, doesn't it? But you see, that's, that's I, I don't know of any other way to explain it than that. With many other exhortations, let's go on to verse 18. With many other exhortations, he preached to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, being rebuked by him concerning Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, he added above all this that he shut John up in the prison. So with that end of that sermon there, he was trying his best to encourage these people to come to God and truly live the lives that they were supposed to live. He was preparing them for the Messiah that was to come. But another part of his preaching also rebuked the leaders of the land. I think I showed you a chart a couple of weeks ago about Herod and his family and how this one brother would marry another brother's wife, okay? Herodias, and I think I'll talk to you about this as well, Herodias was a kind of a woman that she wanted to be with kings and she wanted to be known for being a queen okay Herod Philip had actually moved to Rome and was just happy to his large stay there in Rome and stayed there in Rome Herod Philip was married to Herodias at first but she obviously was not happy with his climbing up the kingly ladder so what does she do she goes and marries his brother and John the Baptist dared to tell him you don't have the right to have her, her as your wife. Again, in the Old Testament law, a brother could not marry another brother's wife. Okay? You see that in the Old Testament law. So John was just telling it like it was. and didn't matter if he was a king. didn't matter if he was a lowly sinner. He told it like it was. And so as a result of that, this Herod the Tetrarch, obviously, as you read the story in Matthew chapter 14, Obviously, was so henpecked, I guess you'd say, by Herodias, by her pushing him to greet or to meet greater standards of being a king, that he did a lot of things just to make her happy, and that included the death of John the Baptist. So you see, Luke just tells us that short story there, whereas the fuller story is found in, uh, I'm going to say it's Matthew's gospel. Matthew chapter 14. So, before, however, this happened, John, by verse 21, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass Jesus also was baptized. Now, that brings us a lot of questions in our minds. Number one, if Jesus, why was Jesus baptized? Matthew, again, helps us to understand this a little bit better. Whenever you read about his baptism in Matthew chapter 4, it emphasizes the idea uh, John says unto him, I have need to be baptized of you, and why are you coming to me? And Jesus said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus would not have been baptized for the remission of sins, for he had no sins to remit. He had no sins to remit. But he did it to fulfill the righteousness. 
that he was submitting to the baptism of John because this was what God had commanded at that particular time frame before, again, his ministry got started. So this was part of what was happening here. They were baptized, and, and Jesus also was baptized. He submitted to that baptism. He humbled himself, even though, again, going back and read Matthew's account, John said, I need to be baptized by you. And he says, no, you're going to do this because we're going to fulfill all righteousness by doing this. <clears throat> Luke tells us that while he prayed, the heaven was open. And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Three times in the gospels does God actually speak. Number one, at Jesus' baptism. Number two, at the Mount of Transfiguration. And number three, at the cross. The very beginning, the middle, and the end of Jesus' ministry. All righty. So it's extremely it's significant, this, as you're looking at this in this respect. Now, the rest of chapter three um, goes through the genealogy of Jesus. All right, I want everybody to raise your hands because how many of you love genealogies? One, anybody else? Of course, there's not many folks on camera tonight, so I'm just gonna have to guess, okay? Let's just suppose that half of you like genealogies. You like to go back and go all look at all that stuff. That's okay. That's all right. But how many of us, you know, whenever we're looking at Matthew's account, Matthew chapter one or two, and Luke's account, Luke here, chapter three, how many of us, whenever you're reading the Bible, how many of you actually sit down and read this, okay, and try to figure out all the names? Most of us gloss over that just that quick, don't we? We really, really do. Like the first first nine chapters of Second Chronicle or First Chronicles, where it's nothing but names, and it's like, why do I need to know all of this? Two or three things I want to point out to you. I am not going to go through that entire list. I'm not going to go through that entire list. But I want you to notice, number one, Luke tells us that Jesus began his ministry at the age of 30 at the baptism of John. So that tells us that Jesus was 30. And if his ministry lasted about three and a half years, that means that he was about 33 years old whenever he died upon the cross. So that gives us kind of some time frame there. Number two, in Matthew's genealogy, he is going through Joseph. He is going through Joseph. And the reason for that is, is because he's tracing his lineage back to Joseph's being the stepfather, for lack of a better term, of Jesus, to trace his lineage back to Abraham. That's the way he wanted to do it. And in fact, if you read Matthew chapter 2, uh, whenever you get to David and the, the people that follow David, okay, I uh, want you to keep this in mind, but whenever you get to David and the people following David, that's the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. So that's just another interesting idea. I think what Luke does here is trace not so much Joseph lineage as Mary's lineage. Why? Because again, um, she was the one that bore the Christ. Another thing that Luke does here that Matthew does not, Matthew stops with Abraham. Luke goes all the way back to Adam. And I think, again, the reason for that is, is Luke is mainly writing to, and remember, we've talked about this in chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, he's mainly writing to a Gentile audience. So <clears throat> what was significant is not so much the idea of um, the Jewish lineage being in the house of David, as Matthew was, but Luke is trying to get across to us that there are Gentiles in the lineage of Jesus. Interesting enough, as you continue to go on and look at this, it is Luke that tells us, Luke is the one that tells us um, let me make sure of this before I before I say it. I don't want to get this wrong. Um, I 
I kept saying Matthew 2, it's Matthew 1. Sorry about that. Yeah, okay, I was wrong. In Matthew's account, there are four women mentioned. There are four women mentioned in Matthew's account. And I think that was very significant as well. If you read Luke's account, there are no women of this mentioned at all. Now, why was that? Well, if you go back and you look at the stories of all these women in all these situations, um, with the exception of Mary, uh, you have to realize that these women were, as you look at it in Matthew's account, Matthew chapter one, uh, you have Rahab, who was the harlot. We remember that. Uh, we remember Bathsheba, who was the illicit, or, or the, you remember the situation with David and Bathsheba, as well as you remember um, Rahab the harlot, uh, Ruth, let me see, is it Ruth? Yeah, Ruth, who had been, her husband had died and had been remarried. Some people make a lot of emphasis about that idea that some of the women in, in Jesus' lineage was not the most pious women that we might think about, okay? When you think about Rahab the harlot or something like that. And the reason that I think this is very important is that even in Jesus' lineage, in fact, think about it in this respect, in Jesus' lineage, whether in Luke or in Matthew, all these folks were sinners. All these folks were sinners. That kind of does away with the whole idea that we inherit the sin of our father, right? It does away with the idea of, of us in, inheriting the sin of our father and, and the sin being transferred from generation to generation. Because obviously it was not because Jesus lived that perfect life and died for our sins. So, as I said, I'm not going to pick up too much more than that. I've gone through 38 verses tonight. It's 827. I need a drink. Uh, water. And uh, so I'm going to give you all the opportunity to say something and uh, go ahead and unmute yourselves. If you have any questions or comments, bring them up and I'll try to answer you and um, we'll go from there. Thank you. Stop the recording. Thank you. See?